My guest today takes culture one step further. Many guests have come on to practice care arguing that a good culture is a must-have ingredient for a private practice to thrive, and they're correct. But my guest today says, well, why not let culture drive your practice instead of finance? I'm Carl White, principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that what they want, but I really believe that care is better when it's just you and your provider sitting at the table trying to figure out what's best for you. And nobody else is secretly whispering in your provider's ear what their own agenda is. Whether it's a hospital, a health system, owners in faraway lands, whoever, may, whoever it may be, if they own the place, eventually it's going to happen. I think it's better when they're not there at all. And my guest today is Shane Littleton. Shane has a master's in healthcare administration and is the CEO of Chisholm Trail Pediatrics in Round Rock, Texas. He's been with Chisholm Trail for 11 years and CEO for the past five. Shane understands how to balance business and healthcare while focusing on the patient first. When Shane became CEO, he vowed to secure the future of Chisholm Trail Pediatrics by keeping his same mission and values, but catering to an ever-changing market of patients and parents. Shane and his partner have succeeded in this by staying independent, focusing on excellence, and keeping a family-like culture centered around compassion. His business model is based around building relationships. As pediatric primary care providers, the most important part is having a solid relationship with their patients that is centered around trust. Shane, you got to be a busy guy with all this. Thank you for taking some time to come on Practice Care. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's great. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. So there's a lot in your bio to unpack, particularly in the context of culture. But let's start with you. And, you know, as I was reflecting on it, the question is, how did you get involved in pediatrics and primary care? I mean, pediatrics is obviously primary care. They've got to be two of the toughest in terms of a business model to succeed these days. My God, Shane, why on earth would you do this to yourself? <laughs> well, it's not to be I'm a millionaire. I'll say that, Carl. Uh, but no, I wasn't one of those guys that wanted to become a pediatrician as a kid. I didn't even want to really want to work with kids growing up. I went through wow. uh, and got my bachelor's degree in psychology and at the last minute decided to pivot to medicine and I okay. crammed in all my biology courses in the last semester of my senior year, which was not a lot of fun. I wouldn't oh recommend my God. That. And I was going to go to med school. My, I started dating a girl and her dad owned Chisholm Trail Pediatrics. Wow. And so I shadowed him to decide, well, I have a good in here. Maybe I do want to think about becoming a pediatric doctor. Mm -hmm. And during my time with Dr. Ramsey and Chisholm Trail Pediatrics, I learned that medicine was probably not my thing. And I really um, liked the business side of it because he owned his own practice. No one else ever owned Chisholm Trail Pediatrics except for Dr. David Ramsey. And he kind of let me see how the sausage was made behind the scenes. And it intrigued me. I found out that my strengths were more in management and finance and business than actually medicine. In hindsight, it was the best decision I ever made. Mm. So I started working for him as a manager when I started school and went and got my master's in healthcare administration and saved me five years of school. And now I'm a doctor's boss instead of a doctor. And I love it. So you went from all in undergrad, you went from psychology to pre-med to not so much to this before you even got to medical school? Yeah, I, I never even went to medical school. Just That's went a, got my master's in healthcare administration. That is a whirlwind nine months or so. Yeah, wow. yeah. And I was bartending the whole time before that too. And you know what? what I wanted to do. And I was bartending before that. All right. Well, I guess you slept later. Yeah. Um, lots of, so yeah, so you went from not kids at all to kids and it was just was it just being around kids every day? You said, oh my God, I really actually like this. Yeah, it, you know, there really is a, a, a sense of um, accomplishment when you are able to change someone's day, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're able to change a kid's day, mm -hmm. they just love it more. And kids are not biased. Mm -hmm. Kids in, in generally, they like to be happy and like to have fun. And I like to be happy and I like to have fun. And I like yeah. to have fun at work. I don't want to feel like I'm working when I'm at work. And I think other people are like that too. And being around kids just kind of helps the day go by yeah. if you're a kid person. And I wasn't a kid person going into this and I became one. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Kid smiles at you. It's hard not to go, huh? That, uh, <laughs> it just makes you pause for a second. Yeah. So it's, a, it's right. The whirlwind tour and usually the idea or the topic of culture doesn't come to people so quickly. Um, usually there are exceptions and, and 
So my question for you, you know, have you always been so culture focused? Where did that come from? Yeah, so it came from two places. First, my master's in healthcare administration. The difference between that and a master's in business administration is the human factor. So these programs that are coming up, these MHAs, they are pumping people out that know business but understand the service industry of healthcare. Mm -hmm. So right from my first class and my master's program down at Texas State, they were hitting home. This is not a normal business degree. Yeah. This is a healthcare degree. And your clientele is the healthcare of people. And so people need to be the focus of your degree. So they hit home the human aspect of business and service in every single class that I was in. That paired with my father-in-law, Dr. David Ramsey, who owned Chisholm Trail Pediatrics, already ran his company this way. Mm -hmm. I was inheriting kind of this old school mom and pop shop where they were all family. Yeah. I mean, his wife was a manager for so many years. Yeah. And the lady that was a nurse is an aunt to my wife kind of, you know? Yeah, it really is. And so even though they started to grow, he just held on to that. And I inherited that philosophy from him. And also what I was learning in my business classes, my healthcare business classes. Right. And I was able to kind of slide right in and just kind of hit the ground running and take this little cool foundation he started and make it even bigger and greater based on these principles. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I, I never thought about comparing an MBA to an MH. I have an MBA and, yeah. and you're right. There was definitely content related to culture, but I would say it was on par with, at best, finance and accounting and marketing and everything else. And, and then you go live it. And, uh, you know, some of my larger company experiences are, you know, one company, huge, 10 or 15 divisions, everyone had its own culture, you know, I mean, it really shouldn't be that way. And the other one had a very strong culture, but was kind of quirky too. So, um, and all that can sort of get pushed to the side when, the quarterly numbers are coming due. It was it's not that extreme, but it's it's it it there's it's it's sort of malleable between which one's more important, the culture or all the other stuff. And it doesn't sound like it's that way for you. Um, so when you say culture driving the business instead of finance, it sounds obvious what it said, but unpack it for us. Tell us more about what you mean by that. Sure. So I do 100 percent of the finance and I carry that burden for the whole company. Okay. So no one else worries about it. You mean you I do the books, you you watch the numbers, that's what you mean? I do everything. Now, okay. I have outside consultants. I have an accountant. I have sure. uh, another guy who has a master's in finance who's going to be slowly coming on and probably be my future CFO. Okay. He's with some strategies and stuff like that. But in the end, I carry that burden by myself, and I don't present the doctors with quarterly number reports on how they're doing financially. They don't know how much money they're bringing in. They don't care about how much they bill, about how much they code. All this stuff that I saw in my residency that drove that business and the larger healthcare systems, my doctors, my managers, nobody sees it. They don't care because I tell them to focus on one thing and one thing only, and that is the healthcare of the patients. Now, a little secret is I say that, but in my manager meetings, guess what their top priority really is? Numbers. Their staff. Their staff. I got it wrong. Their staff. Yeah. You know, because I really feel like a valuable staff member is 1,000 times more valuable than one patient. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to lose one patient, okay, not fun right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere we failed, maybe didn't meet expectations. But if I lose a valuable staff number, it's like losing a thousand of those. Yeah. So, okay. So let me go back. When you say you never tell a doctor how they're doing, do you mean, you don't mean how the practice overall is doing. You mean, wow. Dr. Dr. Carl, you know, your, your numbers are down from last, from where they, is that what you mean? Like doctor yeah, I'll tell doctor? Me, uh, either of them. Nope. We, yeah. we, um, so we evaluate our doctors on uh, a purpose statement, which I, we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. We evaluate our doctors on how they are treating their medical assistants, mm -hmm. on how their patients love them, the stuff that patients write about them online, their employee, reten their, uh, their employee patient retention. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff we evaluate our doctors on and their impact on our culture. Carl, I have hand one of the best pediatric nurse practitioners in the country and one of the best pediatricians because they were awful on culture, even though their patients loved them and they're bringing in millions of dollars. Hmm. I don't care. Because in the end, 
the culture is what we're going to focus on. And that's why I'm expanding to a third location. I'm building my own buildings or, you know, right. we're about real estate company, all this kind of stuff. And we're competing with the larger companies who are just using economies of scale to get by. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've got to applaud it. I'm sure it wasn't easy to do to, to let those folks go, but you know, one of the marks of, of a culture is, do you really enforce it when the whole world sees the, your world sees, you know, whoever, whatever doctor, whatever nurse, whatever, they're violating it. And so if, if you let people violate and nothing's done, you start to erode the culture, right? right? Or at least the credibility of it, but, but you're not letting them do that. So you're the guy watching the numbers everybody else is measured on their impact of the culture. So that was kind of a lead into it, but what, what's an example of what your culture looks like? I guess if you could give us sort of the overall statement and like what it looks like, because cult, culture is important, but it could be very, not vague, but it but it's 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 soft, right? In, in a sense. And so if you can give us a, an example or two of what it looks like day to day, help people wrap their head around it, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, and I do have a purpose statement, but when it comes down to yeah. it, it's being nice and respectful to people around you, no matter what their title is, no matter what their tenure is, mm -hmm. and no matter what role they have in the company. And I hold people accountable to that. Okay. And when people come to me, because I have an open door policy, like every CEO should, they mm -hmm. come to me and they file a complaint about somebody. And I assess the situation and I take it to heart in real time. And I always try and figure out whether there's a bad egg somewhere or if it was a misunderstanding or mm -hmm. if there was a miscommunication somewhere, which honestly is 90% of the time yeah. it is, yeah. right? And how we can improve that communication. And sometimes you just bring two people in the room, like she said this, he said this, you meant it this way, you took it this way. Mm -hmm. Perception is reality, unfortunately. So everyone needs to work on their self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I teach a lot of self-awareness and emotional intelligence teaching hmm. because you have to be aware of the way you're coming off to people. You can have the best intentions in the world and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because if you're being perceived as rude, negative, disrespectful to the patients and coworkers around you, yeah. it doesn't matter what your intentions are. Yeah. Sorry. It, it's so true. I mean, I, I, I use this line one other time in my professional career, but I, I was what I'm reminded of every once in a while, you see, you know, you, you read something or you see something about these couples who have been married 50, 60 years and you ask them, what's, what's the key? Great communication. We just, we communicate so well. What none of them ever say is great mind reading. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's 50, 60 years together every day. Now yeah. two people who, who work together are expected to read each other's minds. It just, it doesn't work. It fails every time. And I was, I wasn't wrapped on the wrist for saying that, but I was like, come on, Carl. That's what I was told. Come on, you back, man. Come on. What am I supposed to read this guy's mind? Anyway, um, <laughs> so that's one. Are you willing to share you know, the purpose statement? Yeah, absolutely. So our purpose statement is we are devoted to building relationships and serving each of our patients, employees, and their families. So we do two things. Okay. We serve and we build relationships, mm -hmm. right? Now, we build relationships with three different types of entities, the patients, the employees, and their families. And when I say their families, I mean the families of the patients and the families of the employees. Ah. And a lot of other owners out there in business, you know, yeah. executives don't understand this. Primary care pediatrics is dominated by women, as it should be. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are bad male doctors. The male pediatricians are awesome. My business partner is one of the best pediatricians I've ever met, mm -hmm. but it's predominantly women. Mm -hmm. I want their partners, their spouses, their husbands, whoever it may be to feel comfortable for the guys that they're coming to work with every day. So an example of this is I go out to dinner with them. Mm -hmm. I have them meet us. I let them interview us because I want them, I want them to know that their wives or partners or whoever it may be that they're sending to work 40 hours a day, that they are protected and they're in a comfortable place. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so when this employee has a bad day at work because everyone's going to, they go home and they complain to their spouse because that's what you do at night, right? <laughs> at least that spouse doesn't already have a negative view of Dr. Kavanaugh and myself for the manager because they've known this. Right. right? And right. so there's just one little small leg up we might mm -hmm. have that mm -hmm. no one else does. And the other stuff is kind of self-explanatory. Obviously we want to build a relationship with our patients and the patient's families we mm -hmm. want to build relationships with our employees and our coworkers, and we want to serve our employees and our coworkers. One thing that I've been saying since the day mm -hmm. I stepped in here is that if you think that I come in and I'm the boss of where everybody else, 
you're absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. I walk in and these women, these people, I work for them. Mm -hmm. And that is the attitude that I come in every single day. It's called servant leadership. Mm -hmm. And that is what I preach. That is what I teach. And that is absolutely the expectation I have from my managers. And I hold them accountable when they're not executing. Yeah. And, and you know, I forget which company it is. And um, yeah, I forget the name of it, but very similar philosophy, which is, of course, our customers are important. Of course they are. But we really want to take care of our employees because if our employees are happy, guess what? The customers are going to be thrilled because guess who deals with them all day long? And so a lot of places jump over the staff straight to the to their to their patients or their customers and just we got to make them happy and then you kill the people who are making them happy so to speak and then shockingly patient satisfaction customer satisfaction goes down and everybody's up, upset and wondering why you flipped it which is which is really nice do you have an example of something that you've tried or something intrinsic about a culture that just doesn't work or didn't work to help give people you know kind of the other side of the because measuring people's hard, watching people's hard is very soft. The whole thing, you deal in a very soft way of running your practice. You really do. It's, it's, it's the way, but it's very soft. So give us something that, you know, it just flamed out or didn't work or doesn't yeah, work. You can overcorrect. Obviously, you can overcorrect anything you do. And I have done that before throughout mm -hmm. the years, a couple of times. An uh, example of that is I get a complaint from an employee about another employee mm -hmm. and it sounds so egregious to me that I jump and act because I take things seriously, right? I'm like, this hurts someone's feelings. This was bad. This is bullying, whatever it might be. And I get that employee and I write him or her up and I'm not happy about it. And it turns out I didn't give them the chance to give their side of the story. Mm. And their side of the story completely changed the narrative of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I've since learned from that. So yeah. I have done some overcorrection where, you know, I don't put up with any type of bullying or anything. So when I get a sniff of it, my ears perk up. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Not happening under, in my house. Yeah. But I've now learned that you always have to go get the other side of the story before you make a decision on the outcome of what's going on. Yeah. So yeah. I have learned that and I've gotten burned by not doing that before. Just kind of jump into with gathering the facts, man. It can be hard yeah. in the heat of the moment. It can be really, really hard. Yes. Um, I want to go, but you sort of referred to this uh, at the beginning. You're expanding. You're adding another location you know, you don't usually hear this in primary care here in the United States of America. Uh, when you combine <laughs> pediatrics and primary, their stories are of course out there, but they're not the headlines. Um, are, are you convinced it's it's because of the way you're running the place? It's gotta be. Because... And it couldn't be anything else. I mean, tell us well, more about that. Like make the case to somebody listening. Okay. You know? Yeah. Uh, one of the main uh, factors that's driven us is our ability to say no to those people that want to buy us. And Dr. Mm. Kavanaugh and I's drive to stay independent. Okay. And, you know, it's really easy, especially after COVID, to sell out and take a payday. But we are driven to stay independent. So much so that we put it in our bylaws, basically, that we can't really do it, even if we wanted to, because we want to stay independent. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we are expanding. We are uh, opening up their location. I'm yep. transplanting my Round Lock branch from the office the office facility that's in right now to its own building that we're going to break ground next month and build our own beautiful ranch style building. Nice. And the reason why we're able to do this is because my overhead is lower. Hmm. My overhead Talk is more lower. about that. Yeah. Well, I offer a better work-life balance. My doctors, for example, average about 18 patients a day. Okay. You go ask any other pediatrician in the country, they're going to say anywhere from 25 to 40. Yeah, that sounds light. Okay. And they're bringing in money. They are. Mm -hmm. And mine, I focus on work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I have very creative compensation packages. Okay. For providers. But it's not, I'm not battling the big guys dollar for dollar. I'm battling my culture. I'm putting my culture over them. And I've had many, many employees leave for money and come back. Hmm and take a pay cut to come back because they understand what they're missing. Mm -hmm. My doctors, my nurse practitioners get to leave at five o'clock every day. They're not charting on 40 patients a day. Because remember, it's not just seeing the patient. Yeah. It's charting yeah. on these very elaborate, very complicated electronic medical record systems. Yeah. And they're spending family time doing this on the weekends and after work um, or coming in early, whatever it may be. Mine don't have to worry about that as much. They're not getting paid as much. They're not, but they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. 
so comfortable with it that this fall I signed 80% of all my providers to two to six year deals to stay on board. Nice. No one's going anywhere because they like what we're doing and they're getting paid not as much as everybody else. And okay. they know that. But they know that if they have an issue, we're open, we can talk to them. Mm -hmm. They know that they're going to be taken care of at work. They know that we're going to cater their job around what's going on in their lives personally. Mm -hmm. Instead of just making a blanket policy and saying that's the way it is for everybody. Yeah. So, so the difference is, is work-life balance. And that's what you sell. You're right, because how are you supposed to compete with a hospital on money? On salary money? Compete on yeah. other things, but you can't. You can't. Yeah. Is And is two to six years, is that... That's a good long time. That's is that kind of unusual to get that? Uh, the six year deal is the law, the, the biggest deal I've ever given to uh, okay. a doctor. And then we have a couple of nurse practitioners that are on two year deals. I have another doctor on a four year deal. So, yeah, I have a couple of doctors and nurse practitioners that are just year to year because they just like it, but I know they're not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I allow them to, you know, drop a, a day off a week if they want to restructure their contract. Um, I have a couple yeah. of part time, I have a couple of gone part time to full time. Mm -hmm. And I hear what they want to do and I cater the job around their lives. And it does make it a little bit more stressful for Dr. Kavanaugh and myself and sometimes the staff. But you know what? That's what we're willing to do that others are not. Is there anything you're willing to say no to uh, when it comes to these types of conversations? Yeah, I've had a couple of people ask for like even more paid time off. Okay. Things like that, um, which we're pretty generous because we don't pay as much. We do offer a robust PTO package, but I have to kind of dial it back sometimes. And I say, look, um, I have to cap it because every time you're gone, one of your peers has to cover for you. Right. And I, that is a negotiable factor, but we don't want to burn out the other peers because you're taking off so much. Right. Because I have to not only focus on your individual work-life balance, I have to focus on everyone's work-life balance. There's a ripple. And sometimes your work-life balance does affect someone else's. Yeah. But the biggest factor here, Carl, is I hire people that will have those conversations in a graceful way and they have empathy. Mm -hmm. I pick who I allow to work in this place very, very carefully. They're going to Which we could have a whole separate, how do you find people? Oh, yeah. How do you interview? That'd be a separate episode. Oh um, yeah, that, that's separate, but likability yeah. and maturity. Yeah. Be likable. Yeah. And you know, the fact that you've got a well-defined culture means you know what you're looking for, exactly. which is, you know, who fits. Um, exactly. Some places say, I've got to, I've got to tailor to them. That's backwards. You got to define who you are and what you're willing to tolerate and you go find people who fit it. Very good. Very good. And yes, on, on how to find people, we could have a whole separate episode. Yeah. This we could keep going on further, but in the interest of keeping practice, practice care more on the bite-sized size of advice, uh, kind of bring us home to the finish line. Two questions I ask every guest. The first one is, is there anything you think I should have asked you uh, about what we're talking today, but just did not? Hmm. Let me think about that one. I think that you might be intrigued to ask about the dynamic between my relationship with my business partner and I. It's very unique. So what is the dynamic with your <laughs> Let's have yeah, it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> you can't uh, see that up and not expect me to take it. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Kavanaugh and I, we have 100% trust in each other. He runs the medicine, I run the business, and we split everything 50-50. Mm -hmm. Everything. And... A lot of doctors that own businesses are not really allowing, they don't, they don't like guys like me coming in and telling them how to run the numbers, mm -hmm. but then they go back and they understand that they don't really know how to do it. So some, doctor, some get to that point. Yeah. Some, some point get there. <laughs> but the level of trust that I have between Dr. Kavanaugh and myself, and it goes both ways is unusual. And uh, we practice everything on a dyad model, which means businessman and a doctor. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to do what we do. And he doesn't, you know, he, he gets involved in some of the bigger financial decisions. Like him and I love to strategize. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, the business stuff, he kind of lets me do it. And the medicine stuff is all him. Mm -hmm. And we work very harmoniously and we stay in our lanes. And we there's very little overlap there. But you can only do that if you have an immense amount of trust between you two. And we're like brothers. Yeah, and I would, I would think that... If there was some, you know, bleeding of the edges, it'd be more him bleeding into yours than vice versa. Because, well, a what, little bit. Honest, what would you comment on in terms of the care of a patient? I, I'm sure there's some things, but you know, 
but the other way around, everybody's got an opinion on business, you know? The, where I get involved with the care patient is uh, the customer service level that we're providing. Yeah. And what I'm hearing from the back end, yeah. you know, and he gets involved obviously about his and I's compensations, mm-hmm. what kind of bonus structures we want to do for ourselves this year. And the other thing that makes us different is that we are not greedy people. I just made an announcement to the whole company that all profits made from, I was like October 1st until December 14th, all profits are going into the Christmas bonus pool. And Dr. Cavanaugh and I threw our bonuses in there too. Wow. And so the whole company knows that for these last two months of the fourth quarter, all every patient you see or don't see is going to impact everyone's bonuses. And Dr. Kavanaugh and I are throwing our personal bonuses into that pool again, because we're not greedy people. We don't do this for the money mm-hmm. and we want to make sure our staff are taken care of. There you go. Cause you're right. Staff, good staff leaves, man. It blows a hole of pain uh, into the whole operation. Awesome. Um, and then the other question I ask is, so, you know, we've caught somebody's attention who's listening and they want to get going on culture. They want to get going on some of the things that you talked about. What are one or two simple, practical, tangible steps they could take as soon as they're done listening here to get going? Yeah. First of all, get rid of the bad eggs. Do not be afraid to fire highly skilled or highly tenured people. Wow. Get rid of them. Usually when there's an episode of drama going on, I like to call it, it is like a wheel and spoke. Hmm. And you have a central hub in general that is causing all that drama. So what most managers will do is they'll, they'll start picking off the spokes and trying to get rid of some people and try and fix things. But what they don't understand if they were to just do a little more work and figure out who's the hub, you remove that. Yeah. And all of a sudden the culture uh, just gets better. I know you've had another podcast about that, but I had an example. I had a, yeah. three people in this company years ago that once they were removed, it hurt a little bit. Mm-hmm. This culture has never gone back to where it was because it was mm-hmm. negative back then and it's gone up and up and up and it's never gone back because of the removal of those three people. So do not be afraid to fire people and get rid of them who are being poisonous in your company. Yeah, and you said, you know, a uh, high, high producing doctor in one case. I mean, that's gotta be, that, that's gonna give anybody pause. Yeah. You know, what's that gonna do to us? And yeah. Short-term pain, long-term gain. So that's one step. Uh, it's a big one. So what's a, do you have another one? Yeah. Uh, listen. Active listening as a leader. Okay. Learn how to do it. Learn how to teach it. Because sometimes the difference between you making the right decision and the wrong decision is reading between the lines on what your employees are saying to you. Yeah. Really listen about what's going on. Dig. One little phrase. Here's one one little tip. And I got this from Quint Studer, who was a, uh, one of the, my favorite authors. Okay. When you go say to someone, hey, how is your day going? Human nature says, going fine. Thanks for asking. Right. But the real good listener will say, hey, how's your day going? I have 10 minutes of free time. You want to talk? Ooh. Then they stop. They go, oh, because most people don't want to inconvenience you, especially the CEO. Yeah. But now you're offering a window. You're like, hey, I have a break. You want to go just chat? Let's go talk about football. Mm-hmm. Whatever it may be. And then something might open up that you never would have found out. And now you can make a better decision. I love that. Use that with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Although you have more time, but yes, no, that's, I like that, that little ad. That's really, really true. That's awesome. Well, cool. Shane, thank you for taking some time to come on. It's a busy practice. Uh, you can tell um, once again, Shane Littleton with Chisholm Trail Pediatrics in Round Rock, Texas. We'll put your contact info in the show notes. So if anybody wants to follow up, they can do so. And a couple of points just before we wrap up. If you're someone like Shane, you run a private practice and you've got some experience on the business side of practice that you think others would benefit from, we really want you to come on Practice Care as soon as you can and tell the world about it. In the show notes for Shane's episode and all episodes, there's just a little form to fill out. Tell us what's on your mind, send it in so that we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Practice Care on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks very much. And until next time.